Welcome to Marriage Heart to Heart. We're Tom and Elaine Waters with Restoration International. And we're looking forward to today's talk. We think it'll make a difference in your marriage. Today we're going to be talking about money matters. And it does matter in every one of our marriages. And so we hope that you have a paper and a pencil because we're going to be talking about three very fundamental principles about managing our money today. You know, one of the top conflict issues in marriage is over money. It's one of the major causes of the breakdown of the marriages that we have today. And one of the reasons is because there's so much pressure today to make money mm -hmm. because many of the lifestyles today are working at such a high level that there's pressure that everybody needs to be making money to, to make it. So money does matter, but how are we handling what's important in the use of money? What are we doing in our marriages? Are we really communicating? We're going to be talking about those three things today that will make the difference in whether money becomes a huge stress, that finances are a stress in our marriage, or that money becomes a blessing in the hands of a happy home and a happy God. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're in the me focus, and I want what I want, and you want to do what you want to do, and how we spend the money, we have conflict. That's right. And this is an area that I can say really wasn't that much of a struggle for us, and I'm glad, because we had enough other ones at the <laughs> beginning to start out with. But this, this idea of just being so self-focused, and we have seen so many couples destroy their marriages because she's going to get what she wants to get, and it's her money, and she's going to run it the way she wants to do it, and he's right. determined this way, and you just see it separating them, and it causes hard feelings, and those mm -hmm. walls of separation to build up, and they destroy themselves over things because it's right. all related to things, what money buys. That's right. In fact, the lifestyle that we, we see lived all around us, and we were caught up in it for a while, it's, it forces us, or it drives us, maybe is a better word. We choose to do it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a driving force that gets dad out there working sometimes two jobs or overtime, our mother out of the home working a job, they're both working now to make ends meet, to try to maintain this lifestyle. And That's that right. lifestyle is destroying the very fabric of their home and marriage. Mm -hmm. It's all backwards. That's right. I told you I'd rather have a lot less to live on and have more time with you than to have more money <laughs> and none of you. Well, I remember when we were making our transition from the suburbs of Chicago to Montana in the mountains there that you made a statement, and we've talked about this several times. You said that you would rather live in a tent and have more of me than to have a fancy home and have me driven to be gone all the time. And I meant it because yes. I was excited about the changes <laughs> that, that we had agreed on that we wanted to do for our marriage and for our family because God really was important to us and our family was really important and we really did love each other and wanted to have more time to enjoy each other instead so of just being out there in the That's world right. doing so many other things. And lo and behold, as we've followed the principles that God has shown us in His Word, we didn't have to live in a tent either. No, we didn't, <laughs> but I was willing. <laughs> and, and, you know, those words were said with, with a willing spirit. God well, never... I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> we never had to, but I was willing to. But we do live a much simpler and happier life now. Mm -hmm. And our home's smaller than the one we used to live in as well. You know, I don't know if you heard this, but we were visiting uh, with a family not long ago, and uh, they live in a very beautiful home a very big, beautiful home. And he made the comment to me, he said, you are a very rich man. Mm. He said, because I can see the happiness that you have in your marriage. I can see the happiness in your children. They love you. They honor and respect you as parents. And I do feel like a rich man. I feel very thankful for those things because you can't put a price on those things. Mm -hmm. And we know some very wealthy people who are driven by money. Mm -hmm. And the world would call them rich people, rich men, but they are not rich in the things that really bring true happiness and peace in the life. So we want to talk about three areas today. And the first area that became 
important to us as we wanted to really experience the right kind of money management was putting God first. And now, I know this sounds very simple, but you think for a moment if you're really putting God first. There are a lot of professing Christians today who say they're Christians and who say that they're putting, well, maybe they don't say they're putting God first, but are you really putting God first in the area of your financial management? Malachi 3, the 10th verse says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me herewith. Here's God saying, Prove me, saith the Lord, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. That is quite a command and a promise. God's asking us for 10% of what he has blessed us with financially to give back to him to continue to sustain the work that he has going on in this earth. Now, God really doesn't need our money. He owns everything, including our money. He gives us the power to get wealth. But God has given us the opportunity to be his stewards to give back because what God knows and what we have learned in our marriage is that it is tr truly blessed and more blessed to give than to receive because we have found that you cannot outgive God. So God wants us to give back. He, he gives us a command and he gives us a promise. The command is that we would return to him as stewards 10% and then that he will give to us blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. That's right. So does that mean that if we, if we give our tithe and our offering to the Lord, to His work, does that mean that we're going to get rich financially? No, that's not what it <laughs> says, but all of our needs will be met. That's right. And that's right. a promise. And there is no question that God has met all of our needs. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that He has blessed us way beyond what we could ever have dreamed in our own marriage and family. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we made that commitment when we were first married that God would be first with our finances. We really wanted God first in our lives and in our marriage. And that's what we said and that's where we thought we had started. But we didn't recognize the two big me's we each had. And we didn't know how to become one big us under God. But God takes us where we are. And I think that's the beauty of it. God takes us where we are. That's right. And then he leads us step by step. And so if you haven't understood this principle before in financing, about one-tenth belonging to God and to give it back to God, we want to encourage you not to be intimidated by it, not to say, well, I don't have enough money to do that, but to mm. take God at His word and prove Him. That's what He says, prove me and I will bless. And so that's the experience that we have found in our home. We made that commitment and when we got paid, the first thing we would do is pay that tithe check. And that was really uh, a blessing for us in our home. Yes, and it's really... It's a, it's a faith step in many cases. It's a step of faith that we believe that God will take care of us. Mm -hmm. Does that mean then, for the person out there that, that may, may not be accustomed to this tithing principle, maybe they've never studied it before, does that mean then that if we look at our paycheck and we don't think that the way it all adds up at the bottom line, that we're going to have enough to pay our bills and pay our tithe, do we still want to take that tithe out at the beginning for the Lord? That's been our choice because if it doesn't come out at the first, it doesn't come out at all. It's the same way in our spiritual walk. If we don't take time for God first, we tend not to have time for God at all. That's right. If you and I don't take time for each other first, we tend not to have time or very little time at all. So it has to be a priority, just like everything That's else right. in our marriage. And it really is a faith decision. If God is calling to us to give back 10% of the first fruits, 10% of the, the first when we get the paycheck, if God is asking us to do that, and he's also then giving us the promise of what he will do to open the windows of heaven, it is safe for us and it has always been safe for us to trust God enough to give to Him first and He will always 
take care of us. And I think it's been a blessing that we've seen that uh, demonstrated in the homes we've come from, from our own parents. That's right. Because we have grown up in homes where both of our families, our parents, practiced this and they were committed to it. And we know, having been raised in those homes, the blessings it has been. Oh, it's incredible. Some of the stories that we could tell, mm -hmm. of, of the at least I know in my family, where there wasn't going to be enough money mm -hmm. in some situations as I was growing up. And God always provided. And I saw it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I saw in that was that I saw my parents, regardless of the difficult circumstances, because my dad, as you know, went through some major surgeries mm -hmm. and insurance didn't cover everything. But my dad and mother always, always set aside their tithe first, even though there were times that there, there was no possible way. And it's amazing to see how God would come through every time mm -hmm. to honor that faith. That's right. And so the first thing we agreed on was that we would put God first in That's the right. use of our money. And how, when we would receive what he, the blessings he gave us, that we would give back to him what was rightfully his. Yes. And then we made another agreement in our marriage. <laughs> That's right. We made the agreement that we would always be in unison, in harmony, for how we spent our money. Now, some people say, well, you know, here you have your money. And when we got married, you were working. You were a nurse recruiter at the hospital. You were making good money. And I was the program director. And we had our own incomes. Mm -hmm. We could have very easily done that. His and hers? Yeah. You, you keep your money, and I'll keep mine. And I can go on spending money the way I want to. And you spend the money the way you want to. But we agreed after we agreed to put God first, we agreed that we would come into harmony on how we would spend our money. That's really what it talks about in Amos 3.3. 3. It says, can two walk together except they be agreed? It's a good question, isn't it? It is. And we wanted to be agreed on how we used our money. And God has really blessed us in that. Mm -hmm. And it's brought so much happiness and peace and contentment because we're not having to fight or argue over, right. I want this and you want that and I want to go here and you don't want me to go there and how that money is to be used. And it's, it's sad when you see how many, how many couples really struggle in this area. And if they could just be willing to say, I will accept this principle that God has in His Word from Amos 3, That's we right. will accept that and look at the unity and harmony that they can have in their home. Mm -hmm. Because now we can be in agreement. And when we have agreement, then it's easy to begin our course together. That's right. The difficulty is that big me again. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about that, that me focus many times because we find that whenever there is a, a problem that seems to be insurmountable, when there seems to be a difficulty we can't get past, it's usually because one or the other of us, or both of us, is slipping back into a me focus. We have never faced anything. And that's beautiful to be able to say never. When we have made this commitment, we've never found anything that God hasn't been able to resolve if we were willing to come into agreement with God and with each other. Mm -hmm. So as long as the me is in control, then the money is spent for what I want. And the bills start right. adding up. And then the stress starts coming. And then the walls start coming up. And division takes place. Yeah. And heartache. And may, maybe even, well, we know families, they have, their marriages have dissolved over financial issues. That's right. So it has been a blessing to be able to agree from the little things to the big things, especially in this area. Because we know it's, a, it's an That's area right. that is, can be very deadly. To move from the me focus to the us focus. That's affected uh, our communication on the little things. It's talked about how we agreed on our bills and how we would look at debt and all these kinds of things that were very important and many people are refusing to look at. Mm -hmm. I remember one family that we talked with and the wife had no idea that the husband had taken a second mortgage out on the home. That's I mean right. that's a huge sum of money against the property and it wasn't until I don't know, months and maybe years later, she found this out, that he had wanted to invest it. That's right. To try to make a little more. And uh, didn't want to tell her about it. Didn't want to tell her about it. 
And that's where we don't have that honesty then in the right. marriage. We need the honesty and we need to be agreed so that we can alleviate dissipate problems. We, mm -hmm. we can keep problems from ever being problems if we're willing to do this and cooperate with this principle. And I know that each of our listeners and our viewing audience can benefit from these principles that we've been discussing too. But we need to take a break right now. We hope you'll stay with us as we go to our third principle when we return. There are many how-to books available, but there's one that's free and perfect for every couple. How you can build a better marriage. Bible-based matrimonial advice is given in a light-hearted, easy-to-read manner for those contemplating marriage, newlyweds, couples in their golden years, and everyone in between. Simply call or write for your free copy of this amazing little booklet, a handy little tool to help build a better marriage. Welcome back as we're talking about the three principles in Money Matters that are foundational to having a marriage that's heart to heart in our areas of finance. The third area that we want to talk about is owe oh, no man anything. Now that's not my concept. That's taken from Romans, the 13th chapter in the 8th verse. Owe oh, no man anything. Now that's a pretty tough statement, isn't it? So what do we do with that? Well, it's, it's pretty difficult in this day and age to not owe anybody anything, especially if you're buying a house. So what we want to talk about is how we can minimize debt, how we can do the best that we can with our finances and be agreed. We knew two families that happened to be buying property, and this was several years ago, they both ended up with a $50,000 mortgage. So, obviously, they both owed $50,000. The difference here is that one couple decided that they were going to do everything that they could. They were going to bend all of their efforts to get this mortgage taken care of so that they would owe no man anything. The other couple, on the other hand, had what I would call a more modern philosophy, and that is that the more money that we can leverage, the more money we can invest, and, and so the other couple decided that they would make some investments somewhere else, and they would just continue to make their basic payment. That first couple, making double principal payments sometimes and putting as much extra on those payments as they could, when they came to nine years into that mortgage on a 30-year mortgage, at nine years, they were completely cleared of that debt. Now that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Very impressive. That means they put their heart into this commitment right. they made. It was a serious commitment that they wanted to owe no man anything. The other couple who had decided to go the, the different direction in their philosophy when they came up on nine years, they owed nearly the same amount of money on their mortgage. And they ended up getting into some financial difficulties that caused them, caused them a tremendous amount of stress. And they wished that they had done what the other couple had done. So when we're talking about owe no man anything here, it's not that we can just eliminate instantly a mortgage debt, but we made a decision and a commitment that we were going to do all that we could to eliminate debt as quickly as possible. And that has been a tremendous encouragement and blessing in our marriage. It has. It's given us financial freedom for years because we've made that commitment. And even when we moved from the suburban setting of Chicago to the country, when we built our home, we were looking for every way we could to stay out of debt. That's right. And by God's grace, we were able to stay out of debt with the interest or the profit that we had made from our previous home, which is almost unheard of. But we also, in order to do that, we went to secondhand stores, you remember, and we picked out <laughs> a toilet from a secondhand store and a sink from a secondhand store. And, you know, those things are still in the house today. That's right. And nobody ever knows a difference. I mean, they work. Nobody they're knew they were secondhand. That's right. They're the same <laughs> color. They're the same style as everybody else's, and they, they do the same thing. So we look for ways to stay out of debt. Yes. And we receive the blessing. 
from that because what it did is it, it didn't put the pressure on you to have to make so much money, especially in your professional change, mm -hmm. you know, from, from being in radiology to going into selling rural properties. Quite a change. Know, quite a change. <laughs> no longer the regular paycheck every two weeks. Now we're getting commission only. That was a huge step. But I knew that I had confidence in you to lead in that. And I saw that by cooperating and working together, rather than working against each other, we mm -hmm. found harmony, even through those, uh, some of those financially uh, difficult times. That's right. And we really want to encourage you that you bend all of your energies not towards the, the modern philosophy today, but bend your energies towards paying off that mortgage. And there is a difference between mortgage debt and what we would call regular debt, or some people would call frivolous debt. When we take a mortgage, obviously the, the people that are on the other end of the transaction have something. And in, in today's real estate market, in most areas, that home is appreciating in most cases. So. If we default on that mortgage, then they're going to get the, the house back and they're going to get it back uh, from probably more than it was worth when we first started in that mortgage transaction. So there's a different pressure there. That's not to encourage mortgage debt, but it is a different kind of debt than when you go out and buy uh, new furniture, a new car every year or whatever, and you put that on a credit card or you, or you start piling up the bank loans at a higher interest rate because if you take that car back six months later they're not going to give you an appreciated value they're going to give you a depreciated value and so there is a difference here most of us can't go out and buy a home and pay cash for it but we just want to encourage you to begin working earnestly and honestly to remove that debt to, to lower it as quickly as possible it's interesting Ben Franklin, we're talking about a man who lived a long time ago, but listen to what he says. When you run in debt, you give another power over your liberty. Hmm. How do you like that feeling? The idea that when you're in debt, you give someone power over your liberty. It's not a very nice feeling. And Ellen White said it this way. She said, avoid debt as you would avoid the smallpox. Now, I want you to think of this picture for a moment. Can you imagine you get another uh, hankering for a new bedroom set? The one you have is fine, but you know, styles are changing. You've had it for another 10 or 12 years. It's so, time to update, right? Yeah, let's go out and get another one. Well, you get in there and you see the perfect one that you really like. And as you're considering the debt that you will accrue, because you don't have the money for it, and so you're going to put it on a credit card, but they've told you now that it's nothing down and no interest for six months. So that's great. Well, six months is going to come. But you put that aside, and you go up there, and you make the transaction. And as you're getting ready to sign that credit card bill, supposing at that moment, that you got a little sign that popped up on the, the cash register that said this, when you sign the transaction, you will get smallpox. <laughs> How would you like that? I would uh, <laughs> not sign the thing and leave the store. <laughs> avoid debt like you would avoid smallpox. I think the problem is, is that many of us have lost the real significance of debt. We live in a society that encourages debt. And we have found the freedom, as Ben Franklin says, we have found that our liberty is better when we don't have it under the power of another. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about what love really is, and I know in previous programs we've talked about respect and restraint. And as we let that love of Christ work in our heart, and I, and I respect you, that helps me to choose to use those funds mm. in a way that keeps our family out of debt or for you to be careful on how you manage the funds to keep our family debt free or to keep us right. from having that financial pressure. So I think that we can bring in here in our marriage the love chapter, seeketh not our own, mm -hmm. but is, looks for ways to be able to keep that harmony and that unity in the marriage. And you know we will, as we have seen, we will have more time together you will have more time together 
as you can take those debts down, take the pressure off so that you can have more time for the marriage and the family. Yeah, we're reinvesting our, our, our assets and we have each other as an asset. That's and so right. let's spend the time there instead of things that drive us apart. That's right. Well, I think we need to look at a personal challenge now because each one of us has to come to grips with this in our marriages. And so the three areas that we discussed, we want to look at what we can do to make those a reality in our experience. So we encourage you to consider each of these three principles from God's Word and ask yourself, what are we willing to do? What am I willing to do? And what are we willing to do together? Are we willing to put God first mm. and let Him prove to us that He is the God of all flesh and there's nothing too hard for Him, that all of our needs will be met? Are we willing to agree together with each other on how those funds are to be spent? how we're going to manage those funds. And we're going to be talking about that in a later program, the actual managing of those funds. But accept and, and agree on that principle that we will work together, start wherever we are, and begin to make those agreements together on where those funds are going to go. And lastly, that owe no man anything. If you have debts, look for ways that you can get out of debt as fast as possible and cooperate in the littlest things. It's $5 here and $15 there and $8 here, and that adds up to a lot of dollars in a year. That's right. Well, I think it would be good to, to pray a prayer of commitment uh, that we can enter into these and that our viewing audience as well. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to put you first. And we pray that as we do this in our finances, that you will open the windows of heaven and that you will be our God and we will be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we look forward to having you join us again. In our next program, we're going to be talking about managing our money, the specifics of how we sit down and look at the budget, and how we make those decisions for a marriage heart to heart.